Um, I would like to remind you that Shafti Pro's fraud report is live on the webinar. So you can just get your copy uh, by simply donating it from the website, uh, downloading it from the website or click the link. Secondly, I would like to point out that we welcome questions from the floor. Um, but however, in order not to break the chain of thoughts of our guests, uh, we will monitor all questions and we'll select towards the end of the dialogue um, questions for him to respond to. So you are encouraged to send us your questions, uh, but you know, be, be aware that we will only have our guests answer them or respond to them towards the end. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our guest, a renowned name of the industry, Mr. Mr. Jeremy Flats. Uh, Jeremy has over 40 years of experience in the compliance and regulatory field. He transferred or transitions rather from commercial crime investigations to becoming the regional money laundering prevention officer in Asia PAC with Standard Chartered Bank. And then in 2003, he started his own consultancy. And since then, he has been a consultant ANL to the Hong Kong Monetary Authority and became a chief compliance officer for two e-commerce startups. He remains active today, of course, and working in the money services field. So, hi, Jeremy. It's really nice to see you. How are you doing? Hi, Barry. It's been a long time. It's, uh, it's great to catch up again, and uh, thanks for having me on. Well, absolutely perfect. Now, you have a very impressive and broad base of experience. Um, obviously, it takes years to accumulate, but you've seen both sides of the coin. You see the entire era of changes. You watch the creation of the uh, AML KYC framework, and you actually follows the entire concept behind this evolution for since it started in like 20 years ago. Now, you know, suffice to say that you have seen a lot of changes and experiences in that area. Um, care to share with us a few thoughts from the AML perspective, Jeremy? Yeah, sure. I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a living, breathing animal. I mean, it's, it's developed over the last 30 years. And uh, I suppose I've had the, uh, the pleasure, if you like, of uh, working through this uh, entire regime. Um, I mean, obviously, from the police background, um, you know, the investigation side, to then moving into Standard Chartered, where, if I'm honest, back then, I mean, it was very much uh, the early stages of uh, AML compliance. Yeah. Um, so I suppose I've seen the, the modern version develop from the very basics about 30 years ago. Um, that all started with the, the introduction of um, anti-money laundering laws in 1989. Mm. Uh, initial requirements to identify customers, um, then the expansion of the law in 1994 uh, to embrace a wider, wider range of offences. Uh, and then, of course, the, the horrors of 9-11 in 2001, which I think if everybody is honest, that's probably the, the real mm. kickstart to uh, the events today. Um, well, in what way? I mean, do you think that that's... I mean, basically, I think uh, at the time regulators had, or governments had realised that some of the big people involved in these uh, terrorist incidents had actually been active in their countries for uh, a long time. Uh, and yet the financial systems had failed to pick up on this, uh, this sort of thing. So you had um, the US government introduce the Patriot Act pretty quickly. Uh, and from there, you had uh, terrorists designated as uh, um, specific individuals. Banks had an obligation to search out these people on their systems, to develop systems to make sure uh, terrorists didn't have accounts with banks. And essentially, the whole need to know the customer uh, has grown from there, from the very early stages, I mean, when I started in banks, uh, in banking, um, few of them at that time actually took copies of ID cards. Mm. Um, correspondent banking relationships were opened on the strength of a, a tested telex. So you compare that with what is actually happening now. And there are 
substantially more requirements, much more, much more onus on, on banks to uh, comply with the law and regulation. So in that, in that, that's, that, that sounds great. And, and what impact did, you, did that have on the financial institutions, do you think? Uh, increasingly over the years, it's, uh, it's become a heavier and heavier burden. Um, the way it works in the world at the moment, the Financial Action Task Force does uh, evaluations on, um, on countries according to their program. That then is passed to the, the governments in the country. The, the governments themselves then apply those requirements the financial institutions operating uh, in their own countries, and subsequently that pressure comes down to the the banks and the other the other regulated entities. So um, it's very much the need to identify customers, the risks related to various groups of customers, um, and to develop mechanisms that actually manage those risks. Uh, and of course, while all of this is going on, there is the need to uh, monitor transactions on uh, on the accounts in case there are uh, suspicious uh, suspicious activity. I see. Now, I think most, if not all, of our audience uh, here today understands the terms of KYC, know your customers, and AML, anti money laundering. But Jeremy, I think uh, with your background, not many of us who understood what it meant and, and then things like that, the way you do, because you've been both in the private sector and in the public sector, such as the Hong Kong Monitoring Authority, as well as being one of one of us, like a service provider of these solutions. Uh, now yeah. you're also a certified MRO and a consultant and all that, you've done it all. So explain to us, you know, to, to us who knows a little, only a little bit about KYCML, what does it mean from your, from your perspective? Uh, KYC, CDD, it's part and parcel of the same thing, but as I said before, if you, if you look back over the years, banks and various other organisations, they didn't actually get a full picture of the organisation or the client that they were dealing with. Mm. Um, the fundamental problem with that is if regulation is introduced where you then have to monitor activity on the account if there is anything suspicious and you've got absolutely no understanding of the customer's background because you didn't do any uh, due diligence mm -hmm. at the time of opening the account then you've got no basis for comparison and apart from maybe looking back over account activity nothing that really gives you a picture of what the client does and where the money is coming from uh, therefore KYC is part and parcel of the, uh, the process, uh, both at the start uh, of a relationship and throughout the course of the relationship. It's not just something which you do at the beginning and then forget about. Mm -hmm. it's, it's part of a process which you've got to yeah. maintain throughout the, uh, the account relationship. So, um, and that requires that you obtain sufficient information uh, of a potential customer in terms of identifying who they are from a, an identification document. In Hong Kong, it's quite easy with a Hong Kong ID card or mm -hmm. items passport. Um, identify where they, uh, where they are living through proof of address. Um, you also have to find out, again, this is an area which is often neglected, uh, is the source of the funds which mm -hmm. are going to be used to fund the account. Right. And also, depending on the person's background, the source of their own wealth. Um, quite often, this is overlooked. It's seen as one and the same thing. So um, this also gives you an indication of the expected uh, activity on the, um, on the client's account. Uh, so that if there is something unusual on the account, an unusual activity, you can then actually have a basis and a background of information to look at uh, to compare that unusual transaction with what you're seeing on the customer's background. Um, but what we've seen, what I've seen over the years is that um, quite often banks haven't done that. They're trying to remediate some of these accounts, which is often difficult. Um, 
and as a result of this, uh, it's landed many, uh, many organizations in trouble. Wow. Could you break that down a little bit for us? Um, yeah, sure. I mean, if you, from a supervisor's perspective, putting my um, HKMA hat on uh, once again, um, essentially what regulators are looking for is that you have a process in place uh, that not, not just that you've got the technical requirements that you gather information on customers, mm -hmm. um, but they're looking to see exactly what information you've got uh, to see if you understand the risk related to that yeah. customer and how you're actually managing those risks. So, I mean, in theory, they could walk in, they could, they could select your organization for review. They come in, they sit you down as a compliance officer and they say, well, okay, who are your clients? What's your client base? What are the risks? How do you, um, how do you quantify those risks? Um, and how do you manage those risks? And it's, this is very much at the forefront of what the, what they're looking for. I mean, every bank probably has a policy, an AML policy, which um, I'm sure everybody has seen at some stage. They've probably all developed processes of some sort, but sometimes that's where there's a bit of a breakdown. There is uh, a bit of a gap between the actual technical side of things mm -hmm. and the actual implementation. So. Um, as an example, there's obviously a huge difference in risk between uh, me as a local uh, current savings account holder yeah. with a, a meagre salary being paid into it, <laughs> as opposed to, say, um, uh, an offshore incorporated company that's registered in, in a tax haven dealing with uh, high net worth individuals. Yeah, so, I've, you know, it's funny you say that, but, uh, like, um, is this something... What we know as the risk-based approach, is that what it is? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's fundamentally what it, uh, what it comes down to. Right. It's, uh, um, and this is what you see time and time and again from regulators. Mm -hmm. They are um, pushing this idea of a risk-based approach. And what you're getting, what, that's, what that effectively comes down to is an assessment of where your greatest risk is. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm sure with, amongst our viewers, there are probably many of them who are thinking, well, we don't have enough resources to actually manage the compliance risk. We don't have enough technology to manage that. And regulators themselves, they're, they're all familiar with some of these issues. And so what they are looking for is that you apply your resources in the best manner possible to the areas of, uh, of high risk. And so what they want is to see uh, a documented process um, where you've looked at each customer, decided what risk is going to be allocated mm -hmm. to them and how you're then actually going to, to manage that. And there's various ways of doing this thing. Um, which is perhaps why some, some organizations have found themselves in difficulty because each bank is slightly different. Each, mm -hmm. uh, each set of customers uh, in terms of geography, region, uh, whatever, there are different risks uh, attached to that. And uh, there's no one size fits all. So you can't just download a template from the internet, fill in the gaps and assume that that will pass muster with the, uh, the regulator when they come in. Um, you've got to give it some serious thought, look at the various risk factors involved. As some banks do, um, they come up with a risk scoring model, and then they will focus their resources on looking at those particular issues um, with greater frequency and greater emphasis, um, as opposed to looking at my own particular account as something about uh, a much lower risk. Uh, absolutely, I agree with you. I mean, every entity would have its own special uniqueness and they, they have different clients that they want to, to, to uh, provide services and, and they have various different types of risks that they would look into. So everyone is different. Now, would there be any core sort of uh, indicators or, or, or instances whereby 
any one of those would at least have to look through. I mean, just like they, these are the minimum they have to look at. Is, are there such details you can share with us? Yeah, I mean, sure. Um, if you take, for instance, uh, uh, a private banking client mm -hmm. he's a high net worth individual, he's got lots of money. You look at geographical factors, the country that perhaps he comes from. And again, I mean, we're talking about a private banking client, it could be uh, a bank as well. But I mean, um, the geographical factors, where the person is located, the risks related to that, uh, that country, um, are there perhaps uh, high levels of corruption, fraud? Uh, is it an offshore haven? Is it known for particularly uh, dubious activity? Mm -hmm. um, obviously, the product involved uh, is another 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 risk factor. Yeah. So, yeah. let's say private banking is one of them. Correspondent banking is another uh, another issue which has caused uh, problems to some banks. Um, the nature and size and complexity of the business. Um, the individual person is he simple day-to-day -day person with a, a salary and a, a wage going mm -hmm. in? Is he a high net worth individual? Does he live in the country mm -hmm. where um, he's trying to open an account? Or yeah. um, well, the other, the other um, risk factor is um, politically exposed persons. Um, so again, these are all some of the things which, which you need to look at. Um, the way in which customers are onboarded is it face to face uh, onboarding? Uh, is it done remotely? Um, these are all a, you know, a range of things. And as I said before, the source of wealth and the source of funds, um, this is uh, again something which is often overlooked. And so at the end of the day, what you're trying to do through all gathering all of this information is to get a private understanding of, of what the customer is, is doing. And you have to be able to demonstrate that if the regulator should come knocking at your door and uh, asking you uh, to demonstrate your, uh, your AML regime. Right. Right. Actually, you know, that's, that's a very long list and, and that's very comprehensive from, from where I am, of course. Um, but what, with what, what you just mentioned, there seems to be very many logical and even commonsensical indicators to assist organizations to have a really better understanding uh, financially of their customers. And before and even after they're onboarding, because they, they have to look at, like you said in the beginning, there is a base and then you compare the, 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 the latest activities to see whether there are any suspicious transactions and so on and so forth. But, you know, having said that, we have seen a lot of media reports that corporations still fail um, to exhibit absolute controls and you know proper controls. What was the what was the most common of those failures? Do you think? Um, there's a range of them. I mean, I mean, let's let's make it clear. I mean, a lot of the a lot of the sanctions that have been imposed on banks haven't arisen because they have um, can be convicted or found actually laundering money. Mm -hmm. A lot of the time, uh, a lot of the well-known failures um, basically been failure, you know, failings in one form or another to conduct uh, adequate KYC, inadequate monitoring, failing to have transaction monitoring systems in place, um, as well as insufficient resources to tackle mm -hmm. um, money laundering. Um, so, I mean, a lot of the penalties have related to um, basically failure to comply with regulations. It's not necessarily cases where they've been involved in money laundering. Mm -hmm. But then on the other hand, again, uh, if you look through the internet, there's, there's plenty of cases um, you know, involving criminal failings where banks, again, have deliberately helped to move funds uh, for sanctioned individuals or, or countries. Um, uh, I won't go naming banks in particular, but I mean, there are some in the region that have made the news very prominently and people have been convicted of, uh, of money laundering and uh, 
uh, heavily sentenced as a result of that. So, um, so yeah, it's 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 not necessarily fear of being caught in money laundering. It's uh, there's also the pressure to make sure that your regime complies with uh, regulations. Right. So, so there are two 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 things. Right. One is not being compliant fully, uh, and and the other one is the criminal failings. That which is interesting. You mentioned that because recently I read some, some report saying that last year in 2022 the global fines for prevent failing to prevent plus financial crime exceeded eight billion U.S. dollars, and a surge was like 50 percent, and. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, some even say for the first first consecutive year, there was a pronounced rise in the number of firms saying that they choose to incur AML fines rather than, you know, all the time. It, it, it's an increase from 60% to almost 80% uh, last year. But obviously, for our audience today, we are not here to be concerned with those. We want to do the right thing and hear your insights as to how to assist them in doing so. So now fines are increasing the infractions, some of them repeatedly, um, some even choose to pay fines instead. You know, I must ask, does this in any way imply that financial penalties alone are not an effective deterrent or incentive? So you, some, some would like to use that word to do the right thing. Yes, what do you think? It's an interesting question and it's probably a topic you could spend at least another hour on alone just, just, just discussing that. But I mean, I remember at the time when the idea of a financial penalty came into force in Hong Kong, there was a lot of concern and banks were worried about mm -hmm. the impact that would have. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly there was um, a lot more pressure to make sure that you know, systems complied. But um, from the research that you point to, um, it does make you wonder whether some banks are now actually deciding for one reason or another, uh, it's a risk that they, uh, that they want to take. Because um, if you look at the way a lot of the things have gone in the US where you have um, DPAs, Deferred Prosecution Agreements, it's essentially a commitment by the bank to pay a penalty in return for not actually being prosecuted. And millions of dollars have been um, accumulated that way through these these particular fines. Now, um, in terms of how whether they're a deterrent, I think some banks certainly will see them as deterrents. But if you if you compare the penalties, perhaps with some of the the profits that these banks make, it is in some cases a comparatively small sum. Mm -hmm. I mean. Just yesterday, I was seeing on the uh, the news, you had the case of the uh, the betting organisation in England, uh, William Hill. They've been fined nineteen point two million pounds for AML and various other regulatory breaches. Um, nineteen point two million in comparison with the amount they actually make on a uh, you know a yearly basis is very small. So it then leads you to the question of well. Do you then have to uh, look at, you know, sanctions against individuals, criminal liability there? Um, bearing in mind as well, it's not only um, financial penalties that can be imposed. You might get other um, um, other punishments. Some banks have been subjected to monitorships, where an independent organisation comes out and actually spends a year or two working with the bank, chasing you to make changes. And if you've got to do that on top of your daily uh, daily work, um, satisfying an independent uh, de facto regulator, that's a particular challenge. And then the worst, the worst case scenario is you actually have your license withdrawn. So um, there are various penalties out there. And I think when it comes down to individual liability uh, that's that's an area which as I say it's um, we could discuss that one for a while <laughs> yeah um, I, I you know as in our discussion we also have talked about the individual's accountability on senior executives after all you know the decisions came from the top 
um, whether they should be held liable for some of these breaches. Like you said, it's going to take a, another another seminar or another webinar to talk about. So, so let's turn our attention to the um, uh, regulatory authorities or some call them monitoring bodies. It's of interest to understand, you know, what leads to these discoveries and how do they monitor? Or do they monitor and, you know, where do they take the lead from to, you know, who I should investigate and so on? Mm. Okay. I mean, again, I think, um, I don't have the specific breakdown, mm -hmm. but again, from my, my own experience, I mean, a lot of regulatory breaches generally come from uh, on-site examinations. Yeah. Um, globally, I think it's fair to say that regulators are stepping up their game. Um, FATF, Financial Action Task Force, is extending its uh, its range of um, mutual evaluation. So um, regulators, in turn, they apply that pressure to institutions. Um, but the way it works with an on-site examination, as I mentioned earlier, is that the regulators will come in and they will look to see if you have the technical aspects there mm -hmm. uh, that meet the requirements. Yeah. And then they look at the effectiveness. It's the same thing that the, the Financial Action Task Force does with mutual evaluations. They will, um, they will see what laws exist uh, and whether there are laws, regulations in place. Then they look at the, the effectiveness. So how are these things actually being applied? Are they working? And are they coming, uh, are, the, are they being effective in that respect? Um, so, I mean, I'd say on-site examinations are one of the reasons. Uh, sometimes they might originate from a, a suspicious transaction report from a party. Mm -hmm. um, Again, from experience uh, locally here in Hong Kong, I mean, if you get several banks making a report about a, a particular company, then again, that might trigger uh, some sort of in, um, investigation. Yeah. Um, I think also there have been some other instances where banks themselves have realized that uh, they've maybe done something wrong and um, in the spirit of being good citizens, they've actually uh, put their hand up and uh, owned up to the uh, the issue. Um, there tends to be a bit of a, um, a relaxation in that respect, insofar as the regulators might take a, a slightly more lenient approach if uh, if banks are actually aware that they've broken the law and are actively trying to do something to uh, to to prevent uh, further transgressions. Wow. I see. So, so now we understand that if, um, let's say, if an organization fully implemented the the correct and proper AML KYC framework and deploy the risk-based uh, approach and actively monitor for those risk indicators, like you've mentioned earlier, and you know, even so, then by definition or by by inst inference, then such an organization, if they stand. If they, even if they're under the scrutiny of the regulator's uh, authority, they will still be okay. They will still be on solid ground. So, which is a very logical thing that for them to do. But, but there must, you know, there are still some, you know, apart from those criminal failures, um, there would be some pain points or challenges in, you know, in the whole ecosystem you know, to prevent them from protecting themselves from these, you know, failings. What was your comment on that? Uh, yeah, that's a good one. Um, again, I mean, it's, it's been a while since I actually worked directly in a bank myself. Mm -hmm. But I mean, um, from what I've seen over the years, without doubt, the success or failure of an AML program, it will depend very much on the tone that comes from the yeah. top of the organisation. Yeah. Um, if the senior man is very um, governance-based. If he's got, if he's a friend of compliance and he appreciates the value of, uh, of what you're trying to do, the task will become much easier. Um, sad to say, though, that this isn't always the case. And again, I've seen instances where 
um, AML compliance, you know, that is, that's, uh, that's Jeremy's job, you know, it doesn't concern me, you know, <laughs> leave it to, uh, you know, yeah. leave it to them, they can, they can sort it out. Yeah. Um, so again, if that is the case, and unless the um, uh, compliance officer is not particularly senior, it's an uphill battle and mm. it's increasingly difficult to get anything done. So in terms of, in terms of getting additional resources, in terms of uh, getting funds for monitoring systems, this becomes a lot easier if you're in a position to impress upon the senior management the challenges that you face, the challenges that they might face if they're caught out, mm -hmm. and try and reach a, a, a stage where there is cooperation between the two functions. Um, again, sadly, compliance is seen as a bit of a, uh, a revenue blocker. Yeah. It's, uh, it doesn't immediately produce a return on investments, mm -hmm. uh, and it's a cost center. Um, and we've seen instances where banks trying to save costs, they will cut back on compliance people. Yeah. Um, having said that as well, I mean, it's worth looking at it from the, uh, the, other, the other side of the coin, whereby um, some banks have decided that they will uh, um, um, take on a lot of compliance people. So they have recruited over the last 10 years or so, there's been heavy recruitment into the uh, compliance industry. Um, so on the surface, that might appear to satisfy regulators where you say you've taken on 200 compliance people. Um, but again, what they will do is go back and say, well, okay, you've got 200 compliance people. How effective are they in improving the regime from what it was before to what you've got now? What's the value add that they've made? Um, extra bodies on seats doesn't necessarily translate into no. um, uh, improved compliance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay. Um, so the, it seems that the, um, the determination or lack thereof from the top, um, the cost and the human expertise could be an issue. Um, but besides that, um, how about the challenge of maintaining a very robust monitoring framework? So you've got something that you have to refer to, and as well as ensuring that the screening of databases that are always evergreen and accurate. As an example, recently the EU's tense package of sanction against Russia. Um, what is your thought regarding corporations uh, keeping up with the current sanctions requirements? I think that is an area which proves particularly challenging because, um, I mean, on a general level, it is a, a, it's a continuing challenge. Mm -hmm. There are many blacklists that have been published, uh, whether it's the OFAC, uh, SDNs, whether it's the EU sanctioned persons. There are lots of them, and these keep changing or getting updated the whole time. So. It's gone way past the stage where banks can actually do this on a manual basis. There might have been a time in the past where a new customer comes on board, you could do that. But given the speed of banking these days, there is no way in which you can um, screen individuals um, at the same time. So it's essential, I think, that you have some sort of uh, database, mm -hmm. a reputable database, uh, which is regularly updated, contains all, all of the names there so that you can screen against that uh, when you open the account. You can screen it when you're doing certain transactions uh, and you can do regular scrubbing of your database um, you know, as time goes by. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's on, a, on, a, on a, a general basis, but I mean, with the the latest package of, e, uh, package of EU sanctions, um, it's probably as close as you can get to punitive action against Russia without actually uh, uh, firing weapons. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the aim is to cut off uh, funding for the, uh, the Russian military regime. Um, but this is uh, um, a 
And this has obviously been achieved by the EU collectively deciding that they would impose more sanctions on Russia. Um, bear in mind, though, as well, for these sanctions to be put into effect, all of the EU members uh, have to agree on them. Uh, so again, there is some difference of, uh, of opinion, which again leads on to another separate topic of whether or not uh, mm. uh, sanctions as a, as, a, as a punitive weapon actually work. Mm. But certainly they, uh, they, they, they definitely uh, hinder the, uh, the financial workings of, uh, of a lot of these countries. Yeah, absolutely. And I want to pick up on the uh, what you mentioned about reputable databases. Um, first of all, many for-profit organizations are still conducting manual anti-money laundering screening checks, which is inefficient, incomplete, costly, time-consuming, and error-prone. So lack of automation is one thing, you know. The other thing is the need to ensure that the database are, you know, always up to date, like you said. And for that, I would like to mention that Softy Pro is providing a fully automated, fast, accurate, and very recently priced anti-money laundering screening and KYC solutions. So again, I'm picking at your brains now to see what lies ahead of us, like future trends, you, you know, crystal ball, uh, what Jerry Plass is looking at. So what enforcement actions that regulatory authorities might take regarding KYC AML requirements be You'll be interested to know about your thoughts on that. Uh, yeah, I mean, if you look back over the last 20 years, I would say for obvious reasons, the most pressure has been applied uh, to authorized institutions, banks and uh, you know, um, securities companies, that they have borne the brunt of um, uh, regulation um, and so on um, but if you look the 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 AML regulation law covers a much broader uh, range of institutions uh, that are you know should be reporting um, you've got the so-called DNFPBs designated non-financial mm -hmm. uh, businesses um, I think the latest round of uh, the latest plenary session from the FATF pointed out that there'd be a, a greater focus on the NFPBs going forward. So that includes things like the, uh, the real estate agency, um, company service providers, which provide a lot of the um, a lot of the uh, the background and the company formation for a lot of these offshore companies that may have been involved. Uh, at one stage in, in, in money laundering. So um, <clears throat> going forward, there will be more mutual evaluations. I think regulators will be stepping up their game. They will be bringing in more entities, applying the regulation to them. Um, and again, another, another fine example. I mean, I'm doing some work in the, uh, the money service business. And if you look back at that over the last... Uh, 20 years, it was an area which has been to some extent neglected. You could become a money service business simply by registering your name and address with the, uh, with the police. Wow. Um, that has now changed. There's mm -hmm. a totally separate regulator. You have fit and proper tests on the directors, shareholders, requirements there's a lot more stuff there so that is one area which for a long time has been considered high risk that is now being brought under the uh, the regulatory umbrella so i think going forward you're going to find a lot of other uh, businesses actually get brought in and the microscope is going to turn on them right okay thanks i think at this point um you know uh, i would like to focus on what about the tips for corporation, how to put together a functional KYC and compliance infrastructure. And second, what corporation look for from software and what be nice.
If you look back on the it the last system how you know you can, you can stop the whole thing from scratch um, looking back again based on some some of my experience the challenge that a lot of banks have is that they have a range of different systems so trying to get the the uh, trying to adapt old systems to new technologies doesn't doesn't always work um, and in many cases, you might find that banks don't have one complete overall picture uh, of, um, of one particular client. They might have a credit card somewhere. They might have an account somewhere else. Yeah. They might be a shareholder of a business that you're banking. Um, so again, really, it's a question of making sure you've got all, I mean, as I say, it's, it's, it's a topic we could talk about for a long time. But I mean, if you're designing a system, Obviously, you want something where you can pull together all of the information that you've got on your customers. You can evaluate those risks, and then you can manage those risks. So it's a question of how you actually develop that within the framework of what you've got. Yeah. Um, in terms of compliance people, um, it's a good time to be in compliance. There seem to be lots of uh, uh, adverts looking for people. Um, so again, you need somebody who knows the law, has an understanding of the uh, AMO. They have an understanding of the business that they're working in. Uh, there are certain qualifications or the IC they do foundation courses and uh, uh, more courses. So you need experience, knowledge. Sometimes people have worked in different parts, so with a audit background, uh, they might have uh, experience of looking at these things. So and in terms of themselves, I mean it's a, it's a challenging role. You need to be uh, a bit of a jack of all trades. I mean, you need to be able to deal with people, you need to be uh, receptive, you need to be open to uh, questions, you need to be able to manage expectations. There's a lot of compliance in the next to um, staff to take what you wouldn't normally do. But also, you need Experience in the business, a person, perhaps a policeman involved in there, so that you can, be, you can lay down the law if necessary, but within the parameters of a, of a private organization. So, getting people on board requires a and respect. So, um, somebody who uh, yeah, but there's also the other one is uh, patience because um, these things don't always happen. You don't always get instant results, but when you do, uh, it can be quite rewarding. It is absolutely. And thank you so much for all the insights that you share with us. I think at this time I'd like to turn, give the opportunity to some of our audiences. We've got a couple of questions that uh, um, we'd like to uh, like you to respond to uh, let me just read those questions right the first one is what determines potential risks as well i've used that word before as that nobody has a crystal ball um, and the comment is traditionally every everyday merchant verticals have become a violation and have caused catastrophic losses like airlines now currently the crypto is a sleeping nightmare uh, some would say that so that that's that's a question for you, Jeremy. 
Um, sorry, what was the actual question? Was uh, what determines potential risk? I think that's the question. Uh, again, you've got to look at what your customer is and you've got to understand what the business is actually doing. Now, when you mention crypto, that is a new area. It is mm -hmm. something which uh, I venture to say not all regulators fully understand. It's an area which seems to draw quite a large share of adverse publicity for one reason or another, uh, whether it's theft of crypto coins or, or, or one other thing, um, or whether it's, um, I forget the name of it, but the, uh, the one that's- uh, money with money rather than to, to do the monitoring or things like that. Things that they have to do, I'm not sure they should do, as you said, otherwise they like driving without a you know, license. So I think, I think I'll just um, leave it at that. Now, um, another question that came along um, is very relevant. It says, uh, to apply the risk-based approach, is it fine for us to access the overall risk where we don't have certified uh, CDD documents? Essentially, we are making an exception in such cases by applying the risk-based approach. Is that correct? So, um, when I say certified CDD documents, um, again, it depends what you're, you're, you're looking for. But mm. I mean, in many cases, if you're talking about face to face uh, account opening, then quite often customers are going to present identification to you and you will actually see that. You don't have to have that certified. If you're dealing with um, a corporate customer, you can get a lot of the information at face value from um, companies registry. So you get identification details there. You can get a lot of background information on the customer from looking at the internet or um, other resources, media, this sort of thing. Again, there are certain companies that will provide information on uh, customers' background, um, corporate customers, media incidents that they might have been involved in. So you can get a lot of information to actually build up a fairly detailed picture of the person. Um, so there's not necessarily, you don't need to get certified true copies of all documentation to support that. The key challenge that you have is Again, and again, this is why, in my experience, some banks struggle, is that the onus is on them to do their own risk assessment and um, quantify those risks and manage them, and then explain that to the, the regulators. And sometimes they get concerned that the regulators might take a different view. But if you can document it and show that that is what you've done in relation to your risk-based approach, then... Uh, it's hardly for the, the, the regulators might make recommendations, but their requirement on you is that you evaluate the risks and show them how you actually manage them. And if you can do that, then you've, uh, you know, you've, you've, you've passed the test, so to speak. Um, again, turning that to, um, for instance, private banking, if you, if you have a customer there, chances are that you're going to have regular, you're going to have an account review, uh, sorry, a um, uh, customer relationship manager dealing with the person on a regular basis. So um, just getting updates from them, interaction with them, updating the customer profile, that helps you build this knowledge on the customer. Um, and helps you, you know, understand the risk. If they move into new lines of business, you can understand what that is. Likewise, on corporate customers, you're going to have a, a relationship manager. So we're not just talking about gathering some information at the start of the relationship, and uh, and that suffices. You don't ever have to do anything else. That's not the case. It's an ongoing. It's a living thing, which. Um, which you have to work on. Okay. So that, I hope that answers the question. 
right. Okay, I think, um, I think Jeremy, I think uh, we've uh, spent a lot of time on this and I think it's probably the right time for us to close for the day. And uh, I think I really appreciate for those who join us. Um, we are, I am approachable anytime. Um, if you want to ask me or Jeremy any questions, do send me an email, uh, which is barry at shaftipro.com. Um, I'll be more than happy to connect with you again, or if you want to know any more about our services and solutions, by all means, send me an email. Uh, Jeremy will be happy, uh, I think. <laughs> uh, I'm quite pretty sure that he will be happy to uh, answer any of your questions uh, off, off site. So, so after this, and um, you know, thank you again for joining. So thank you, bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. Bye-bye.